This series featuring the wine industry in North Carolina is brought to you by the North Carolina Wine and Grape Council. Goodness grows in North Carolina. Manio, North Carolina, a quaint town that many pass by on their way to the ocean, Nags Head, and Ocracoke. The town has become synonymous with the lost colony and all the mystery and intrigue that story entails, as well as Andy Griffith, the well-known, easygoing sheriff of Mayberry, whom chose Manio as his retirement home. But our reason for today's stop in this quaint little town by the sound is a piece of North Carolina that encompasses something equally as important as the lost colony. Yeah, hold, hold, hold me up. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is, is good. So much to be thankful for and a great bond that I'm still happy that we presently have and own. Well, I think we both like people and uh, it certainly does help attract them. As you get older, you appreciate people coming by. And uh, we certainly are, are both. We enjoy the people coming and we certainly are getting older. I guess that's the major thing. And then the fact that uh, the history that I recognize now as being behind the part of the mother vine that I'd never even thought about as a younger person. But since living here, and different things that has taken place. I've recognized the importance of it as a history thing. And uh, that's another incentive. But the fact that it is a grapevine is the main thing for me. I, I grew up with a grapevine and I'm happy to die with a grapevine. I grew up with uh, a pine almost as large as what we have here now in our backyard. And that was where I made my first dollar or so to start me in carrying my own pocketbook. Came from the picking of grapes in September and selling them to the grocery stores. You see how green and pretty that is inside. There has been a lot said about the uh, early grapevines and, and the mother vine. One of the stories that was written by Paul Green in his show of The Lost Colony, they, they talked about the aroma of the grapes when the ship came in close enough to shore that the grape aroma was outstanding and they carried that message back to England when they returned on their first return sail. 80, 85 years ago, there were a lot more grapevines, scuppering on grapevines on scaffolds on Roanoke Island than there are today. Uh, most every family on the north end of the island had scuppered on grapevines scaffold up as this is. And actually wine was seldom made by any of the grapes here on the island. It was at a later date uh, that the idea came about to make a little bit of wine and the Mother Vineyard Incorporated was created by six or eight local people that decided to make wine for sale. All of this is all new just put in here this year and the vine, unbelievable growth it will grow, the runners will grow anywhere from 10 to 15 feet per year. And when you pull them up and put them up on the scaffold, it doesn't take long to cover an area 10 or 12 feet addition to your, to your vine. And that's what we've done here this year. That vine right there is a key mother runner. That's the one that it all started from is that one underneath there. They tell me that it, it was 400 years old and now they're saying, a few people are saying it 450. I only know that it was here over 90 years ago because at 90 years old and I was here, it was still here and it was being talked as the mother vine and had a uh, arch way over the highway coming to it that said Mother Grapevine. After we had the vine and cut out what we needed to build our house, 
I had interest in trying to keep the vine going then, primarily for our own convenience and to be able to have it as I had a boy growing up. The chances for us to have some grapes and jam and jellies made from the grapevine, not from the grapes or the vine. But as time went along, recognized the importance of it as being, uh, having some history with it. And that was another incentive to keep us wanting to see the old mother grapevine continue to be here and people to enjoy it. Muscatine grapes have been an alluring native to North Carolina since the settlements of the 1700s. Even back in the early 1900s, there were 25 wineries operating in North Carolina growing muscadine grapes, thriving up until the onset of Prohibition, which killed the state's wine industry. One North Carolina family has brought the muscadine grape into the spotlight, making it a well-known variety throughout the country by pressing the muscadines into some great tasting wines. Your vineyards are massive, like they are everywhere it seems like. How did you get to be here? Oh, well we're very fortunate to begin with, but a long, long time ago my father was a school teacher, my uncle was a carpenter, and they decided they needed to supplement their income so they started growing grapes on the side because it was a big winery out of Canandaigua, New York, paying $350 per ton for these wow. native muscadine grapes. Of course, it takes about four years for a little vine to fully mature and get these size, this size. And uh, waiting on their first big crop, the big winery said, Oh, no, 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 no. We have too many grapes now. We can only pay you $150 per ton instead of $350. So my grandfather, who owns the little general store in Rose Hill, said, Hey, clear out the back end and we will start making some wines. And so, of course, they started stomping grapes. We didn't tell anybody their first <laughs> wines were made out of stomp grapes. But... Um, Started stomping grapes, and of course, it didn't sit very well with my grandmother. <laughs> she said, the girls in Sunday school have said you've started a factory of liquid sin, <laughs> and I'm not having it. So we made a couple of changes. We're Methodist now, and we also uh, close on Sunday, so we're like the Chick-fil-A of the wine business. My name is Jonathan Fussell, and I want to welcome you guys to Duplin Winery. We were where we actually started our winery back in 1975. What happened is my father and uncle started growing grapes for a New York winery called Canandaigua. And in 1974, the price of grapes dropped from $350 a ton to $125 a ton. So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. You know, being good old Southern Baptists, we didn't believe in making wine, but we knew the jelly business was uh, taking over already. And also Welch was making grape juices, so we converted them. Uh, being Methodist and now we make wine here at uh, Rose Hill. But this is our first grape crusher. Uh, it is actually an old washing machine mo motor con con basically uh, connected to a conveyor belt that we actually popped our grapes and how we got that design is my uncle actually designed it and built it from this grape crusher right over here which is the oldest grape crusher in America. And it was owned by John Grady, the first North Carolinian uh, to actually die in the Revolutionary War. And from that design is how we uh, formed our grape crusher. In this room is actually where we started the winery. We made all of our wine uh, in oak barrels back in 1975. And that first year we made 20 uh, cases of wine. We were very fortunate enough to be able to sell all of them, got confidence to be able to go to other farmers in the area and we said, look, you know, we don't have money to be able to afford to be able to buy your grapes, but if you give us your grapes, we'll give you stock in our uh, winery. They, of course, needed a buyer for their grapes. They gave us those initial grapes that first year, and we got very fortunate that we continued to sell those wines and continued to grow until 1983. We left this area and built a much nicer production facility right down the road back in 1983. And he built this building, and it's about a 20,000 square foot building, and we had at the time about 100,000 gallons of capacity. And one of the neat things about the story for me is uh, at 1987 as a college student, when the bank was repossessing all the equipment and selling it off, I got hired to come in and pull out my dad's favorite tanks that he bought and I put them on tracks and so I pulled them out with a tractor and caused these scars. So these, these scars mean a lot to me. Uh, 
it reminds me of you know of the really really bad bad days and uh, uh, so each and every day I love just stepping on them a little bit and, and, and walking by but this is where it all began back in 83 and uh, started making wines and then of course lost our tax preference and sales fell from 44,000 cases and by 1990 we were at 4,000 cases and of course we managed to rent this building out for many years and then by 1995 we were ready to take it back over and start making wines back here again but this is where we press all of our grapes and bottle all of our wines and except for our little winery in North Myrtle Beach where we're bottling by hand incorporating some of my dad's old equipment from 1970s so we're hand bottling things back like in the old day did you see yourself coming back and working here when you were in high school I actually thought I was gonna be a banker a banker yeah, that's different yeah because uh, and I majored in business but um, you know my my dad had really struggled so much and we had lost his house and has lost his pickup truck lost all the good equipment that we had the winery was for sale and he was struggling to make payments just on the interest of a 1.2 million dollar loan and uh, there was very little hope for Dupin Winery back in the 1990s but of course um, I did come back and my mom went to school and uh, started teaching again and I took mom's spot and then of course we uh, somehow just got really really lucky and by 1995 some good things kind of uh, changed our path and and today we're the largest winery on, on this side of the Mississippi and we've got 43 wonderful people growing grapes for us and we've got about 160 associates working with us and a lot of them are smarter than me or Jonathan and uh, it's, a, it's still a family affair but uh, there's, uh, we just got a, a, a lot bigger. As a grape sits on the vine, it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and better and better and better and better and better and, better and then not so good and then not so good and then worse and worse and worse. So we're trying to pick all of our grapes at the top of the bale where all of these grapes are at the peak of ripeness. And that's about a three week window for our grapes here. We also grow grapes not only here, we're growing grapes in Mississippi, Panhandle, Florida, Georgia, and in South Carolina because we're trying to uh, dodge hurricanes and late frosts and that kind of stuff but we can't get our grapes from Mississippi or Florida here within 24 hours so we have a pressing station in Dufiniac Springs Florida and that's where we're pressing those grapes and we chill the juice down put it in a tanker and bring it up here put it in our fermenting tanks here and that's where Jason and Nolan start the fermentation. I know you have a window but do you walk down like every aisle of... Not every row, <laughs> no. So a grower will actually blindfold himself and of course he's led into the vineyard by his spouse or his brother yeah. or whoever is working and he has a bucket and then we'll guide him to the grapes and and he just picks grapes blindfolded and we do that because no matter what he's going to pick a grape if he can see the grape he's going to pick the ones that look riper because he yeah. wants her sugar levels to be higher than what they really are so we blind pick actually then we cr crush the grapes in these little buckets and we test the sugar levels right outside at the vineyard and then of course that's reported into Jason and we pay by the grade so all of our growers are hoping to get a grade A grade so that they can get a lot more money for their tonnage um, we have grade A and grade B and then grade C. We do not take any D's and it's scaled down far enough where the grower really is going to try to do his very best to get that rewarded grade A price. And so he's out there picking the grapes blindfolded and testing them. And then once we decide, okay, it's time for us to pick this grape vineyard, He'll go and pick one box, which is about 1,500 pounds, and bring it in. Then we can press the whole 1,500 pounds and get a bigger and better sugar test and acidity test off of that whole box, which is going to be more representative of what he's got in his 10 acres of grapes. Duke One Winery plays a huge role in spreading the love for Muscadine wines all around the world. 
The winery brings even more visitors right to the town where it all started in Rose Hill, North Carolina, by making this town a destination unlike any other. All right, so we're still in the eastern part of North Carolina at the one and only Duplin Winery. And today is a very special day because today is their grape stomp. And this is the event of the year for the wine industry. People come from all over the country just to come stomp grapes here at Duplin Winery. And we're gonna go stomp some grapes and I can't wait, but I'm gonna get a grape first because muscadine grapes are amazing. We're looking forward to a stop off. Woo! Uh, if I get any great beans. Dance for the camera. 
<laughs> no. Absolutely. Do you see now that Duplin Winery is more than just a winery? It's a destination, a place for you to come and visit. Bring your friends and family to see what the Grape Stomp is all about. What do you think about North Carolina's wine industry at this point? Well, you know, if we continue working hard and continue to find good folks who give us our, their good support, we, we can continue growing and plant more grapes here in the state of North Carolina. And uh, we've got some great winemakers here and some great, you know, folks who are who are working hard at growing grapes. And, and uh, I, I just think that we've got an excellent opportunity to continue growing. Uh, as long as we continue working hard and making sure our quality is good, uh, we we got a good chance to keep on going. Where do you see it in 10 years? You know, if you had told me in 1990 that uh, one day this 4,000 case winery would be producing 400,000 plus cases, uh, I'd say, you know, you, you, You've lost your mind. My dad's, uh, my dad's lost his house and lost his pickup truck trying to keep this place open. And uh, the generation before us, though, was a, you know, they had a little more grit than what we we have now. And then the, the next generation, they they're gonna have to pick it up some. Uh, and we're responsible for for making sure that they become responsible for what we're doing. But uh, if we catch some lucky breaks and some folks. You know, have a lot of ownership. Uh, you know, there's no telling. Uh, you know, we make and sell 500,000 cases by uh, 20, 26. Is that right? Yeah. I can't even think that far ahead. Uh, we've come a long ways, and it's uh, simply because so many good people have, have bought our wines and continue buying them, and and uh, we we hug everybody's neck and thank them as much as we possibly can for giving their support. So 20 years from now, when I go to Europe, I'll see your wines, right? Hey, you know, spreading the Muscadine know, wine overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to China. Visit China over there. works? Yeah. yeah. We'll see about that. This episode was only the beginning of a four-part series featuring wineries across the great state of North Carolina. Be sure to check out part two of this series to see where we take you next. We would like to thank the North Carolina Wine and Grape Council for being a partner in making this series possible. If you enjoyed this episode of On the Map, visit onthemaptv.com for full episodes, bonus content, and more. Also, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at On the Map TV. And make sure to check out new episodes every Monday night at 8 o'clock on WHIG TV.